I am thankful for each and every one of you. I'm glad that you are here with us today. And uh, I really believe that for some of you today, God is going to speak to you in such a way that uh, you will hopefully be entering into the very presence of God today. Now, next week on Easter, we're going to deal with one of the, the, the most common spiritual challenges in Christianity and churches and Christian community, but yet one of the probably least talked about subjects. We're going to talk next week about the spiritual doubts that we often have. And spiritual doubts when, after the resurrection, Jesus shows up to the disciples and he says, Why did you doubt? So come back next week. I think it's going to be a a powerful and meaningful service of worship. But today, though, uh, we're going to be talking about a very important subject. As Jesus asked a question to a guy who had been sick, who had been an invalid, for 38 years. And Jesus looks at this man and he says, do you want to be well? And what I want you to do, if you will, is is listen to this message today through the lens of perhaps an ongoing kind of long-term problem that you might have in your life. Because we all have different types of problems in our lives. And and we all have those things that just dog us, that, that plague us, that just won't go away. Uh, for some of us, it might be an ongoing, you know, chronic medical condition. You know, maybe you've, you've had continual headaches. Uh, maybe you have migraines or some other sort of issue that just it won't seem to go away, right? Maybe it's depression. Uh, with some of you, maybe it's an issue with overspending. Uh, maybe for some of us, it's overeating, right? Maybe for some of us, it's overcommitting. For some of us, maybe it's... Some form of addiction that won't go away. You're smoking something you shouldn't be smoking. I don't know whether it's cigarettes or pot or crayons or whatever you got. Um, But I don't know what your deal is, but we all have these deals. We all have these problems. We all have these ongoing issues, right? And whatever it is that you've been trying to quit, it's something maybe you just haven't been able to get over. I mean, maybe for some of you it's an ongoing relational challenge. Someone you love even, but someone you just can't get along with. It could be your dad, or it could be a a marriage, or it could be any of a number of different difficult relationships, right? But you just can't seem to get things working. And I want you to listen to the message through the lens of whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is that's going on in your life, those things that are dogging you and plaguing you. Listen with that as the overlaying lens, those challenges. And we're going to believe that here in a moment, in the presence of Jesus, that we can be changed. So John 5, 1 through 9 is going to be our sermon text for the day. We're going to camp out there for today. John 5, 1 through 9. If you don't have a Bible, there are a few in the the chairs in front of you. And if you don't find one there, there's a whole bunch on the Welcome Center. The Welcome Center ones, you're welcome to take home with you. Those are our gift to you. If you don't own a Bible, take one with you. We love giving Bibles away. We give them to our students. We give them to adults. We give them to anybody who will take them. If you don't have a Bible, take one of those. The other thing you can do, if you've got a smartphone, iPad, something like that, you version good way to look at the Bible, and most of us carry that phone everywhere we go, so we always have the Word of God with us. But if you want, follow along. John 5, 1 through 9 is our text. I'll start in John 1, and it's a very, or John 5, 1, and it's a very uh, interesting story here. And John said this. He said, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem a sheep gate, uh, by the sheep gate, a pool. Uh, in Aramaic, it's called Bethesda. And there you'll find five roofed colonnades. So we have this pool sitting there by the sheep gate. And this isn't just a, a regular old pool. It's a, a natural body of water, probably, probably an artesian spring-fed kind of pool. And verse 3 says, In these lay a multitude of invalids, people who were blind, lame, and paralyzed. Now why were they all sitting there, right? I mean, sure. If you got nothing better to do, sitting out by the pool, getting a tan, that sounds like a good day for most of us, right? But that's not at all what's going on for these people. You see, there was a a local tradition that said an angel would actually come and, and stir the water from time to time. And whenever that water began to, to bubble up, it was believed locally that whoever got into that water first would be healed. So imagine that for a second, right? 
sitting there, waiting, anticipating, hoping to be the first, right? They might wait days or or weeks even. And then as soon as that water begins to to bubble up, it's a free-for-all. Whoever can rush in first, whoever can get there the fastest, whoever can get into that water first, might be healed. So verse 5 says, One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there for a very long time, Jesus said to him, Do you want to be healed? Do you want to get well? Now, as we hear Jesus ask this question, it seems almost like an insulting question to me, at least, doesn't it? I mean, that's like asking a broke guy, Hey, buddy, you want a hundred bucks? Right? I mean, it's asking somebody who's, who hasn't eaten for days and is starving, You want to come with me to the all you can eat buffet? Well, duh. Right? Do you want to be made well? Yes, I want to be made well. Of course. And so he asked this guy, Do you want to be well? And then in verse 7, he says, The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another, another person steps in and gets in and gets down there before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed, and he walked. Hear this. A moment in the presence of Jesus changed everything for this man. So today I want to talk to you about these problems that persist. You see, for 38 years, this man had been sick, invalid, couldn't walk. And in just a moment, in the presence of Jesus, everything changed. I see, as I read through this story, at least three significant challenges for problems that persist. And perhaps maybe you can relate to these like I often can. And I want to go through them all so that we'll all be on the same page. If you're taking notes, the first one is this. The longer a problem persists the more discouraged you become, right? I mean, some of you have had an ongoing problem. It just, it won't go away. And you've prayed about it for a while, right? But nothing happened. And then you tried what you thought might help, but nothing worked. And so you've just kind of become discouraged, right? You tried to work on your marriage and prayed, but it just didn't get any better. You tried to be nicer. You tried to go to church together. It still got problems. You prayed about some physical problem that you had. You you went to a bunch of doctors. You tried one and he didn't have an answer. So you tried another and she didn't do it. And you tried a third and it didn't get any better. And you just ended up getting discouraged. Maybe even to the point of thinking, maybe this is just what God has for me. Have you ever been there before? I have. It's hard not to get discouraged sometimes, isn't it? The second thing, if you're taking notes, the longer a problem persists, the more excuses you tend to make. Right? You start making excuses because ultimately, as we make excuses, it helps us feel a little bit better because we can put the blame somewhere else, right? Rather than the blame being on us. And that's exactly what this guy does. He says, Jesus, Jesus, I don't, I, I don't have anybody to help me get into the water. When I try to get there, I can't walk, right? And they all run by me. And I'm just left sitting here completely helpless. No one helps me. Now, I don't want to be hard on this guy, right? I don't want to be hard on him at all. Because I've never been in his shoes. I've never been an invalid. Certainly can only imagine the difficulty. But let's be honest. There might have been a way for him to to get closer to this pool, right? I mean, he might not be able to walk, but maybe he could crawl. Or maybe he could scoot. Or have somebody tie a heavy anchor out in the water on a rope so he could pull himself, right? Or, or, Or if it was me, you know, as I was thinking about this problem this week, I was like, I'd get like one of those lifeguard stands, really tall, so I could just like 
fall off of it into the water, right? That's the way my brain works. I'm trying to solve the problem, right? That's what I would do. When I see those little bubbles coming, slop in there. But this guy gets to this place that so often we too get to. No one will help me out. I can't do anything about this. Oh, she's always been that way and our relationship is never going to get any better, right? You see, I've been to the doctors and I've tried. I can't get a good job because I, I, I didn't go to college. I even tried going to church twice, two weeks in a row, and it didn't fix it. Nothing happened. I've tried everything and I can't get better. The longer a problem persists, the more discouraged you become. The more excuses you make. And then the third thing is this. The more you tend to compensate. The longer a problem persists, the more you begin to compensate for that problem. In fact, if I can just say it very directly, some of you right now are excelling at compensating for an issue in your life, right? Uh, an example is high-functioning alcoholics. They fit this category very well. Sure, it stresses your marriage. Sure, it's hard on your kids. Sure, at times it might be an issue with your work. But more often than not, because you're highly functioning, you've figured out a way to work around your addiction and make it through day by day. You're, you're highly functioning, even though you have a significant addiction. And some of us, it's for your marriage. You've just learned to coexist but it's dead you don't like it but you just accept it that's just kind of the way it is you've tried everything you know to try maybe even gone to counseling and those kinds of things and yet you don't have any common vision whatsoever there's nothing there there's no spark and you're just trying to get by but you're not trying to invest you're not trying to grow. You're not trying to impart anything into the relationship. It's like a business partnership. The love is not there. You hear things like, oh, well, we'll stay together for the sake of our kids, right? That's what we've got. That's not a good way to go. That's compensating. Some of you may have learned to compensate for a pornography problem. You tell yourself it really doesn't matter. It's not hurting anybody. You've learned to erase the traps, right? You've learned to stay away from maybe getting caught. It's not that big of a deal, is it? You're compensating. Maybe you've learned to compensate for overspending. People look at you and think, hey, they've got it all figured out, right? They've got it going. They've got the good life, the big boat, the nice house, the beautiful truck. But they have no idea for how long you've been living paycheck to paycheck. They have no idea how strapped you actually are, that you are barely, barely making it by, that you've been robbing Peter to pay Paul. Boy, and you don't know how much longer it can go. But you've learned to compensate for it. Here's the problem. Listen to me. You cannot change until you recognize the problem. You will never ever change when you're tolerating an issue. You cannot change what you are willing to tolerate. That's something to write down there. You will not change what you are willing to tolerate. And the bottom line is, Jesus asked this guy, Do you want to be well? Why would he ask him that? Well, perhaps it was because Jesus knew you can't help somebody who just needs help. You can only help somebody who wants help. Big difference. Do you want to be made well? He asked this very specific question. Do you want to be well? In fact, sometimes people ask, what is the greatest hindrance to faith? What is, what is the real obstacle to faith? And some people would say, well, doubt. And we're going to talk about that some next week. Doubt's the big obstacle to faith, right? Well, obviously it is an obstacle. Some people would say fear. Fear is a big obstacle to faith, right? Some people would say worry. Worry is certainly an obstacle to faith. They're all good answers. But I would argue that, that sometimes the biggest obstacle to faith is the familiar. The familiar can become the biggest obstacle to our faith. 
For, for so many people, the familiar is the biggest obstacle to their faith. You see, you don't understand, you'll say. For 38 years, I wasn't able to walk. You don't understand. I've tried everything possible. And so we have this resume of excuses, right? And I don't like it, but I've just learned to manage it. I've learned to work around it. And as we tolerate it, we start to accept it rather than believing what could be. You see, you don't understand, we say. I'm just an average student. So you don't understand, ever since second grade, I haven't been that good at school. You have no idea, Pastor. Our family, we've always struggled. We've always been broke. My parents were broke. I'm broke. My kids will probably be broke, right? That's just the way it is. You don't understand. You don't understand. We're, we're all overweight, right? Come from a line of fatties. You don't understand. You don't understand. I've tried to overcome this addiction. I've tried. But I just can't seem to break through. Here's the bottom line. Until your desire becomes bigger than your disability, you will never start to find healing. Your desire for healing must be bigger than whatever's holding you back. Jesus says, do you want to be made well? Well, do you? Because honestly... Some of us, we're, we're compensating. We're, we're making excuses. And yes, we're discouraged. But simply, we've become used to living with the things the way they are. My hope is today that the Spirit of God today will ask you directly, do you want to be well? Do you really want to overcome that addiction that has been holding you hostage for years? Because some people are more comfortable in the known, right? Right? Even though the no one is uncomfortable, sometimes we are more comfortable with that uncomfortable than the unknown uncomfortable. Does that make sense? I know this prison. I don't like this prison, but I'm comfortable in this prison. I don't want to go to a new one. Do you really want to find healing in that relationship? Do you really want to be made well? Because you can't somebody, you can't help anybody who only knows that they need help. You can only help somebody who wants help. You cannot change what you are willing to tolerate. Until your desire becomes bigger than whatever is holding you back, you will not begin to start finding healing. So Jesus asked this question, do you want to be well? Think about it. Ask yourself this very question. Do I really want to get well? That's going to speak to somebody because there's something holding you back. Something holding you down. And you've been miserable with it for years. The good news of it is, when God heals you, there's going to be no one who is a better evangelist because of it. When you can say, God healed my headaches... When you can say, God help me overcome my fears. God help me get over my addiction. There's power in that testimony. And the longer that it's persisted, the more glory you are going to give to God. Because you're going to realize you couldn't do it on your own. Now I'm not saying God heals all things. He won't. Just ask the Apostle Paul, right? Not everything will be healed. Not everything will be restored on this side of the cross. But hear me on this. Oftentimes, we are the barrier to our own healing. Us. We get discouraged. We make excuses. We tolerate things that we shouldn't. Do you want to get well? And here's what the guy says. The guy says, hey, I've got no one to help me. I've got no one to help me out, right? What does Jesus do? He looks at the man. Get up, right? Pick up your mat and walk. Get up, pick up your mat and walk. Notice this. Jesus heals this guy supernaturally. And notice these three things. Number one, the sick guy didn't even ask to be healed, did he? No. Number two, 
He did nothing to earn it or deserve it. And number three, this is a big one. The healing didn't happen in the way that he thought it was going to happen. Right? Jesus did for him what even he didn't ask of Jesus to do. This is one of the the millions of reasons that the greatest priority in your life should be to press into the presence of God and get to know His Son, Jesus Christ. That's why when you wake up in the morning, the very first words out of your mouth should be, God, today I exist to give you the glory. I want to give you my life and I want to live my life in such a way that it, it makes a difference for you, Lord. My life is not my own. I surrender it to you. Use me as you will. And as you get to know Jesus, and as you press into Jesus, and as you get close to Jesus, and listen to me, He will do things for you, things that you might not even have known to ask Him for. He can bring healing into your life in areas where you might not have even known you needed healing. He'll change your thought processes in ways you didn't even know you were dysfunctional. He'll bring forgiveness and healing into your heart in areas where you didn't even necessarily know you were sick. When you get close to Jesus, He will do things for you that you didn't even ask of Him. Notice the guy didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it. Jesus didn't heal this man because the man was a good man. No, Jesus healed the man because Jesus was good. And that is grace. We can't earn it. We're not good enough for it. We can't get it on our own. We can't work our way to it. And He yet gives us untold blessings because of His goodness, because of His grace, and for His glory He did this. As I pointed out, the third thing is, if you noticed, healing didn't come in the way this man was expecting it, did it? If I can just get in the water, I'll be healed. But his healing didn't come through the water. Some of you have been searching for healing in a particular way, in a particular category, and you're searching for that water. And I came to tell you today that it might not come through the water that you've been looking for, but it may come through the living water. Jesus. Who does something in a way you could have never expected. Jesus says to the man, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. In other words, if you're taking notes, Jesus essentially says, I don't want to hear your excuses, I want to see your faith. Don't tell me what you can't do. Don't tell me what you're not able to do. Don't tell me what other people won't do for you. I just want to see you stand up and walk. Do for you what only you can do. Jesus is going to heal him. But I want to see your faith. I want to see you do what for 38 years you have not been able to do. I want you to have the courage and the faith to step away from the familiar because the familiar is so often a hindrance to our faith. And you're going to have to have the faith to stand up. And when you think your legs are not capable of supporting you, you're going to have to believe and trust in me. We have to do what only we can do. And trust God for the rest. We have to have faith to take that first step towards healing. No more fear. No more discouragement. No more excuses. No more working around it and tolerating it. The first step is always the scariest. But it's the most important step of every single journey. Take that step today. Step towards Jesus trusting in Him, and see what happens. Do you want to be made well? Because God isn't just going to to help someone who needs help. He helps those who want help. Do you want to be made well? Do you? He's waiting. Let's pray.